a bite, a bite of persimmon. Oh. Okay. Intro to storyboarding. Woo! First, we're gonna go over open notes. And these are just fun things that I find around the internet. First up, Oliver Thomas. Oliver Thomas, he has a Facebook page. I don't know if it's like kind of a, hey, come to my Facebook page. But um, there are some posts that I've seen that are just super, super helpful. He's a really, really talented uh, storyboard artist who does live action and animation stuff. Just the way he thinks about boarding, I think, is, is really cool. It's just a different way. But this is just him spending two hours Everybody's storyboarding. Uh, my name just kind of his workflow. Do a little uh, impromptu, impromptu storyboard in Photoshop. So also, if you're boarding in Photoshop, this is a cool thing. I think specifically with Oliver Thomas, a, a really cool thing is like, he's very not precious with his lines. He's just going off of feeling. And then the other aspect of it too is like just perspective, the way he thinks about perspective. He uses his grids and I feel like I've learned a lot of, lot from from him. Uh, but yeah, ridiculously good. A super, super good, uh, super good video to check out and just kind of, um, I don't know, relax with. You can, you can just draw along. But yeah, this this goes through him boarding a scene and his boards, uh, I will say, don't take these as, oh, this is how a, you know, a normal storyboard goes. I would say that for him, this is his process and specifically it is very posed out and it's it's pretty dang animated. It's really animated. Then he pitches through this scene. It's really, really cool to see through. got the two duplicated ones here at the front of him. And he's at some point just bar. oh there's a there's a cool sand slap <laughs> okay but that's Oliver Thomas yeah somewhere he also does have a storyboard he did a that love sex and robots is that is that it uh, he did an episode of that and the entire storyboard is 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 up somewhere I'll try to find that too next up temple of the seven camels this is a storyboard blog that Mark Kennedy, who's a storyboard artist and director and, uh, you know, person who, who's worked at Disney for a long time, has just put together this blog for like 10 years. It's just his thoughts on storytelling. He does really, really break down a lot of great, great advice. I think that this is one of those golden things that if you're looking into storyboarding, this is a, this is a treasure trove of information. People will point you here. So I thought I'd mention it. It's, it's definitely worth looking at. This is a thing on match cuts. Um, basically saying that like when he's boarding out this scene, he is thinking about just kind of where characters are being placed. Like he's kind of keeping these this this guy in line so that when we're cutting around, the viewer isn't looking for where that guy is. That we're we're kind of keeping a visual consistency. See, this would be something that might be like a bit too jump cutty, where we have, we establish the characters here, now he's kind of jumping over here, now we're jumping back. And um, yeah, it's just a great post kind of on that. One of the questions is, would you say that all these storyboarding tricks and techniques can also be applied to comics as well? I think comics and storyboards go pretty hand in hand. Storyboard artists can jump over to comics and comic artists can jump over to storyboards and there's definitely a learning process for each But what is really good? I think specifically in a lot of like Let's say the the temple of the seven golden camels that there are a lot of references that come from old comics from composition of comics just the composition of a single image and that definitely applies to storyboards and then right that completely applies to comics is like the composition of a single image next up character design references you've probably seen this maybe maybe not but there's a ton of amazing artwork on here it's character design references jack.com they've got artists artists that they highlight but but also just like some really great breakdowns of like the art of kill a kill. 
and just kind of behind the scene artworks. Like, I think that this is one of the only places that it feels like you can, man, just find like turnarounds, character turnarounds and uh, and just production artwork and in an organized space. I'd say it's more illustration and anime. This is an amazing website. Uh, take a look at it and wow. If you've never seen these, these kind of model sheets, this is, this isn't exactly a model sheet, but yeah, like this turn around, you know, usually there's a collection of poses that they're all just at the same height. And it's just so that animators can reference this and storyboard artists can reference this as to just how we design these characters at different angles. So yeah, if you're looking into character design of doing character design, boom, look at these model sheets. Look at this website, King of Woo. Adventure Time production blog. I'm sure you may have seen this before, but the, you know, they're really, really good about posting resources and stuff, or just, you know, the production artwork. But it's kingavoo.tumblr.com. And yeah, I think that these are, these are boards from the most recent BMO short thing. And then they have full boards too, um, that they post, sometimes post full boards. But this is super, super great to see, like just the different styles that that also get that all the different storyboard artists kind of have, and then just how these storyboards get done on Adventure Time. It's super informative to just be like, this is what got turned in. You know, this is probably not just the storyboard artist work, but the storyboard and the storyboard artists, the directors, and the revisionist work that go into kind of this final board. Um, but yeah, super, super cool to look at. Oh, wow. Oh, I like that wolf. Well, we'll post those. Yeah, just things from around the internet that I think are helpful. Open notes. Open notes are done. Let's review. We are in class four. We've had three full classes and you have grown as a story artist already. You are blossoming into a pea pod i congratulate you uh, maybe 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 in total we have that first p right you, you may feel like oh man i got a i got a p um reviewing from where we've at we've talked about character posing we've talked about the purpose of storyboarding and how important clarity is to just kind of overall storyboarding and then we've talked about right we have these three shots the close up, medium, wide shot, and just using those in and out, making storyboarding not too scary. And then last class, we talked about the commandments. Your homework was to look at these uh, storyboard reference guides that I, I gave out. Those have helped me a ton in terms of when I started my first job, looking at those and being like, all right, I can do this, I can do this. It's got this simple bit of layout and it can make storyboarding just seem a lot less scary. In terms of those reference guides, we came up with these commandments. Thou shalt draw simple, clear character acting poses with emotion, line of action, and silhouette. Thou shalt keep character proportions consistent. Thou shalt hook up poses and have start slash ending poses. Thou shalt not crowd thine frame. So don't just pack people in there. Give that frame some space. Let it breathe. Thou shalt avoid flat staging and parallels for they are thine devil tools. This is going to be a consistent thing that we continue to explore on is, is as we go into composition, as we go into storyboarding stuff of how do you create depth and ways to, ways to think about drawing so that we can get to a, a more interesting place with our compositions. Thou shalt not break the 180 rule. The 180 rule is something that's scary to a lot of people, but I think that, yeah, we broke it down and it's not that scary. It's just a simple line. Just stay on that line. Stay on this side of the line. If you don't know what I'm talking about, look at the guides. It's not that scary. Thou shalt keep clear screen direction. If I'm throwing a thing this way, it's going this way and keep it going this way. If it starts going this way in the frame, then you're not keeping clear screen direction. Thou shalt avoid jump cuts. Jump cuts happen a lot. And that's our job as storyboard artists, just so that things aren't visually jarring. 
hey, if a person's here, and then this is another person, you know, that, that like, oh, this now here, <laughs> that would be like a jump cut. Okay, I don't, I don't think that that illustrates my point very well. There's a lot in those guides about jump cutting, and it's basically so that the viewer doesn't lose track of where the characters are and feel like the show is jumping around. Building off of that, rules are meant to be broken, right? A lot of these rules, screw it. If we want people to feel super jarred and just freaked out, let's start jump cutting all over the place. Let's start screwing with people's brains and let's cross the 180, 180 line. Let's make it so that, hey, we kind of don't know where we're going. Clear screen direction, that happens a lot in um, action scenes where we're keeping a clear screen direction, but then we're playing with how things are moving and because it's supposed to be a sense of chaos and we don't know where we're necessarily wanting to go as a viewer. Rules are meant to be broken, to be played with, but having a base understanding of these rules, super, super important. In your assignment last week, hopefully you just read those Bibles and drawing from them is super great. Being able to copy, I look down on that, I would say like a good amount. Uh, when I was a student, like ah, copying, you know, the design of you know, uh, SpongeBob, trying to picture yourself working on SpongeBob and then having to keep those things on model. Those guides are super, super helpful to just put you in that space. Yeah, that mental space of, ah, oh, man, I'm working on the show. I need to keep these characters looking consistent and let's keep them on model. It just gets you in that kind of cool space of I can draw. I can draw other things. I can draw your characters, maybe, and they don't just have to be mine. Class assignment. We're doing a little character design. We're going to draw a character design from a prompt that we're going to randomly come up with right now. Artprompts.org. A rocker chick with purple hair. I'm okay with that. <laughs> right? That's what Art Prompts gave us. A rocker chick with purple hair. Yeah, we're just gonna do a design, a character design. I think by rock chick, let's just narrow that down to a person with purple hair. Gender-wise, can be whatever, but they got a mean disposition on life. Let's keep the purple hair. Why not purple? Because we're probably not gonna color these things anyway. <laughs> but it's someone who's just having a freaking bad outlook on life. I know it started as a rocker chick and not all rockers, but I don't, I don't know what rocker means. <laughs> so let's just go with, you know, somebody who's saying no to smiles. Someone who's saying no to smiles with purple hair. Go. Let's spend 20 minutes doing design and we're actually going to watch some videos on character design too, as we all kind of draw. Describing exactly what makes good character design is, is hard, but I tend to think the best character designs are those that don't stand out or call attention to themselves. Uh, it was a huge learning curve for me coming from games to, uh, to film because one of the biggest differences is when you're running around in a game, everything has to look cool. You're, you know, you as a player, you want to look awesome, you want to see awesome things, you want to do awesome stuff but that's not the case in film. In film, it's all about the performance. It's about what the actors are doing on the screen and you're trying to capture that. So I figured out that anything that distracts from that, like if you make the characters too cool or the environments too cool, suddenly the audience is focusing on the wrong stuff. They're not paying attention to the performance that's happening. They're busy looking at some guy in the background saying, hey, I'm a cool character, check me out. So I find that the character designs the audience doesn't have to think about and just make sense and are immediately believable. Those are the best designs. Good character design is a combination of, for me, appealing design, like I want to look at it just because it's attractive to me, and really smart shape language that gives you an economy of description of the character in like the fewest and most concise shapes possible. You just get this really whole view of a character and you know who that character is just based on a few shapes. And I think, you know, if you're going to look at it from Dexter's lab, Dexter's just like this squatty little square, 
you know, with the big triangular glasses, he's kind of hard shapes and compact, you know, blocky little, little, little shapes. And then you have his sister Dee Dee, who's these big noodly, bug-eyed, like big broad circular shapes. And that contrast just says everything you need to know about the two characters. Good character design, I think for me right now, is um, a strong sense of personality um, and a strong sense of um, relatability with a character, whether it's sort of a, a well-drawn design, an appealing design, a design that sort of like, um, I, I like to look at it, you know, the aspects of um, the, the graphics, the pure graphics of it, sort of what hits a general audience is the personality, but what hits us art geeks is like, the, you know, the art aspect of it, you know. So you kind of got to, you don't, you don't, you don't let the draftsmanship slide and you don't let the, the, the soul part of the character like slide either. You just kind of have to balance the two. I feel it's all tied into good design in general. Um, I think it's really tied to appeal. And appeal is like this elusive thing, hard to define. But I feel like it kinda, it's, it's, it's sort of like a, a good pop song where there's something that's immediately digestible about the character or the song. Um, but there's enough like texture and contrast and visual interest. And I think being tied in appeal, appeal isn't sort of it's not doesn't mean pretty, it doesn't mean handsome, but it's, it's sort of like a harmony, like the same sort of tied it into a, a pop song. It has to have this harmony of, of form and detail. I feel for me, when I see good character design, I'm always, I'm like, what makes this amazing? And you know, you, you try to boil it down to, I think it's more mathematical than it is art, artsy fartsy, you know, where the, there's a rhythm in the shape and the detail and the way, um, the line of action, there's all these principles kind of tied into one neat little package. A good character design is whenever you can look at it and you know what the story is. You know, like, um, and then character design goes with good posing as well because if you have a good design, you should be able to read the emotions of the character or the subject. Uh, good silhouette is a good thing. Uh, good shape design. Um, storytelling. I think character design should be storytelling, just on its own. Cool. Yeah. Personality. Right. Personality. Okay. That was that video. What a nice video. Those were all yeah, Disney character design people. Um, this is a video from Powerhouse. And Powerhouse Animation, who does like Castlevania, they just released Son of Zeus, I think. But yeah, they're an amazing animation studio. They're in Texas and more animation studios hopefully just popping up everywhere. This is one of the character designers just kind of talking about, hey, what they think about. Hi, I'm Nick Swift. I'm a character designer and storyboard artist here at Powerhouse Animation. And oh, today yeah. I'm going to talk to you um, about yeah. using basic shapes uh, to add a little more variety like to your character designs. This is more just like kind of watching designs. while you're drawing. So here we have two very basic yeah. male and female designs. They're not bad by any means. They're pretty cute, well-proportioned, and feature body types that you typically associate with the human main leads of a comic, animated film, TV series, etc. They work. One issue, though, is that they are fairly generic. There aren't any features that really stand out about them or inform the viewer anything about their characters. So how could we change things up a bit to make them more unique? Let's start by looking at some basic shapes. We have a square, triangle, and circle. I'm sure you're aware that all drawings are structurally built upon these shapes, but these shapes also carry several ideas and generalizations with them. For example, a square looks and feels solid. It's sturdy, strong, unchanging, unmoving, steadfast and resilient or depending on its size, imposing. On the other hand, there's the circle. It's round, movable, it's pliable, soft, welcoming, playful. And then we have a triangle. It's pointy, which implies danger, and for the viewer to be cautious around it. They're sharp and aggressive, and when turned in other ways, they're unbalanced, teetering one way or the other, and all it needs is just a little nudge to push them over the edge. 
And with all those ideas in mind, we can use these shapes to build characters that not only stand out from a crowd, but their appearances also can tell us about their nature and personality. Let's start with a square. In one way, we could use its implications of strength and sturdiness to design a large, powerful, and imposing character. A wall of muscle that won't budge or back down. Maybe also they aren't very open-minded and are very set in their ideals. They stubbornly adhere to their beliefs, and it'd take a lot of work to get them to change their minds on something. They're an unmovable figure that powers through the hardships that they face. Let's try it with a circle. What type of character does a circle shape make you think of? We could go with a friendly or happy fellow, or we could come up with a nurturing and caring character. The key is using soft and gentle curves throughout the design to communicate that warm and loving nature. Now let's try it with a triangle. You could have an unhinged character teetering on the edge of sanity that lives outside the standards of society at large. Maybe a quick thief that's only looking out for their own well-being that'd sell you out in a heartbeat so that they themselves could elude capture. A sketchy character that you'd want to steer clear of if you ever saw them in a crowded bazaar. These are just a few examples of what you can do when using these shapes as the basis for your character designs. Now there's no need to just stick to one type of shape for each character. Here are a few examples that I've done where I played around with mixing the different shape combinations to get even more varied designs. Notice how the use of these shapes helps say something about each character. With this kid, I used a rounded square for his head, and the triangular body gives the implication that he's a mischievous rascal that's quick on his feet. And the rounded square shape for his head could show that he has a good head on his shoulders. For this woman, I used a circular head and a larger rounded rectangle for her body. The rectangular body makes her a sturdy and strong figure, but the soft rounded edges show that she's also very kind and nurturing. I used a combination of all three shapes in this character. His rounded body makes him look friendly and approachable, and yet his rectangular head shape shows that he's a stern and stubborn man. His forward-leaning stance also helps illustrate that he has an aggressive nature. With this character, the soft sloping curves and big round hair imply that she's a gentle and caring old woman. The triangles that make up her overall design, however, they show that maybe there might be something a little more sinister about her. With this businessman sort of character, I used a very large upper body shape to help communicate that he's an imposing authority figure. The rectangular shapes used in his face and legs show that he's a stern man that stands his ground and won't back down, and with his long Pinocchio nose, perhaps showing that he might be a very deceitful person. One final point I'd like to briefly touch on. Using different shapes to vary your characters not only makes them more appealing and reflect their personalities better, it actually helps create a cast of characters that are immediately recognizable from one another. Let's look back at the generic characters I showed in the beginning. If you were to take several characters that use similar proportions and shapes and look at them as silhouettes, you can barely tell them apart from one another. They look too similar. However, if we were to take the characters that I've used in this lesson and look at them in silhouette, you can tell, even at a glance, which character is which. When there is a more clear visual difference in the character's shapes, you'll have a more varied and balanced cast. I hope these little tidbits have been helpful. There are many more points to consider when designing a character that could be touched on in future videos, but being mindful of the shapes that you use in your character designs should do a whole lot of good in creating a visually diverse cast. I hope this video has been helpful. Thank you for watching, and for more pro tips, visit powerhouseanimation.com. This is just like a base idea. I think that this is taught in an intro to character design class, these base shapes. And again, with all of this stuff, they're not rules, they're just tools, they're just like ideas that have, you know, created a sense of consistency. But also our job is to say like, screw that and to kind of push some of those boundaries and play with them. But you know, we, we also know why we're doing it. I just did my designs, uh, keep working on yours. I've got this person. It's kind of like a Wednesday Adams. Um, I don't know if you can see. She's a little, a little creep. She has fun when people are miserable, and when when she's kind of miserable, she gets mad easy. Yeah, she just kind of does stuff on her own. I think that that's maybe the idea with her. Let's just take a look. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. There you are. Purple rocker chick. Uh, who's just having a bad day. It doesn't mean she's, you know, like there can be a definitely a happy, uh, the brightest rocker chick in the world. But for this one, we're going with like a little little sour personality. 
Uh, this is cool. This is a really cool, like, simple design. Man, I forgot about leather jet or like a spiky thing. The simplicity of this design, I think, is really solid. Uh, cool, cool. More spikes. I screwed up. Bam, bam. Man, this person is going to really mess somebody up. Also, just maybe they're going to get messed up. Ah, smart. I like it. Smart. You're going to have to stick to this character design, but I think you're going to be happy. I think that these shape proportions are, are awesome. Feels very appealing. I like those eyes. Uh, cool. Yes, good work. Good work. Awesome. Yeah, personality. This is going to be an interesting design. Like, this is an interesting design choice. It has the mask, but it's like, can you convey enough with just the eyes? I think you can. I really, I like that. I like that design. Um, cool, sharp edged. Thinking about probably the, the shape language. Hey, maybe these triangles, they're going to hit. Triangles, triangles. Anger. Cool. Cool. I'm glad. I like the simplicity of this design too. Just boom. Pushing it. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, yeah, this would be fun to animate. Awesome. This looks great. Yeah, super appealing. It feels like there's. I just know this person. You know, this person has, I think, the foundations for me to care about them, for them to have a history, and that's that's hard to do, but uh, I think I'm there with that person. Cool, cool. That's awesome. I like the cargo, the cargo pants pocket. I am on board with that. That's a design element. That's, that's like, hey, I, I want to see more of. Cool. Yeah, this is a really great design really smart shape language you see there's just this straight line that kind of comes down where it's just oh this is this is a super smart way to simplify your character and it's just kind of these simple shapes so yeah one thing to think about i think when character with, with character design too is just thinking about solid simple shapes like maybe this person could benefit from simplifying this this down breaking it down into these shapes Cool. I think that she's eating a lollipop. She's not smoking. She's eating a lollipop. <laughs> yeah, simplified design. This would be fun to just see like a personality sheet with that person. Nice. Nice. Yeah, to me, this design looks like a... Oh, man, this is like a background character for like Powerpuff. Or, you know, Dexter, where it's like, oh, man, this is perfect if you need that person in the back to convey that emotion. Where it's just, hey, don't don't talk to me. <laughs> and, yeah, I like the added height with the boots. Solid design. Cool. Stylistic. I think that that would be really fun to see animated. And, yeah, I just like how low this mouth is, too. Where it's just like the length of the, uh, the, length of the nose to the small mouth. It's cool. Um, yeah. It feels like there's just a bunch of different ways to kind of play with these shapes, but we are kind of seeing consistent person, right? I think that that what is nice in terms of what is really cool with character design and getting a lot of different takes on an assignment is just like the what hit, what didn't. Let's go into the white server. Yeah, design, design, cool. Awesome work, awesome work. Yeah, we're getting strong. Like, yeah, I think that this is cool. This is building also off of our stuff with character posing and getting strong poses. And it feels like, man, this straight line is creating a real grounded foot. Cool. Yeah, this looks awesome. There's a lot of story to this. And immediately, like, I want to read this graphic novel. Just a story-filled design sketch. Uh, yeah, just interesting use of, like, shape. Yes, rocker chick. Yes. Yes, please. I'm always for the simplified design. This will tell a amazing story and I'm sold. Cool. Cool designs. Cool designs. I like that one. 
yeah, this one, I would love to watch a movie or just whatever show this is. Cool. F follow that, uh, that gesture. Nice work. Nice work. Yes. 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 I like that simplified face. I see a, immediately like a, I, I was like, ooh, I'm drawn to that hair too. And it's Cloud Strife. Cloud Strife. Looks cool. Cool. Simple. Simple. Yeah. Keep looking through. This design I think is really, really well thought out. It just feels grounded and it feels like it's kind of ready to be animated. Like, oh, this person has their proportions kind of figured out, a style has been set, and you're ready to like animate this pixel art or like a, like a game design character, which is great. Awesome. Uh, nice under sketch and then building on top. Nice pose. Nice pose. Keep building. Awesome. Everybody look through this. These are going to be used. We're building off of this. Keep your rocker chick in mind. Because today we are talking about the simple saviors of storyboarding. So last week we talked about the commandments. And then these are things that really help to simplify or just their tips and tools, their tricks that make storyboarding simpler. Yeah, I think that I kind of use them every time that I start a board. But first, I'm going to say our assignment now because I'm actually going to do the assignment um, and use these simple saviors. So assignment. What is it? Take the character you designed and give them a rabbit to take care of. <laughs> Storyboard a scene about their relationship. We're going to do like 20 panels plus, however many you want paying attention to the storyboard commandments and save your rules. So we're building off of what we have learned with our progression of shots, you know, the three shots that we have, the stuff that we've learned from last week. So the, the commandments and the you know, ideas of screen direction. And then now we're boarding stuff. You're going to use those principles to do this assignment and also use these tricks to kind of maybe help you do it. I think that in terms of this, they can have already had the rabbit the rabbit can come into their life somehow. It can be this type of situation where they find the rabbit on the street. Just a simple scene about these two relationships, this rabbit and this rocker chick. I'm gonna do mine using my design. So I would suggest using your design. This is a home assignment. I'm only gonna do a bit of my storyboard, but you know, I, I suggest that since we didn't have an assignment last week, th this upcoming assignment, this rabbit assignment, Take your time on this and think of it as a, hey, I'm doing a full storyboard in some ways. This might be a portfolio piece in some ways. These prompts are really, really good to actually put in storyboard portfolios or just for practice in general. Because yeah, you might come up with 50 to 100 boards of this simple interaction that tells a story not through dialogue. I will say that we shouldn't have dialogue in this. That's going to be tough. So we only have the visual to rely on. Let's dive in. When I talk about these saviors, it's storyboard concepts that save time, that make your board look better, and are just things that when you start the job, when you start storyboarding, it's good to know these things. These are things that are commonly used and terms that are kind of commonly used. So if you're new to this stuff, these might be new concepts, but if you have some storyboarding experience, you might already know these. First one of the storyboard saviors is shorthand. What is shorthand, you may ask? <laughs> it's taking a complex design like this one, or maybe, you know, like, hey, if you were to have taken your rocker chick and rendered it out and added a bunch of stuff, and then we're simplifying it so that in terms of our storyboards, we get left with something that's easier to draw. I would say that this is a really good shorthand. This one right here is a really good shorthand of this character, of the character on the left. That center character, I think, would be good shorthand for that more complicated character for their storyboards. Shorthand can sometimes be a final drawing, can sometimes be used as a final board, but sometimes, yeah, you need to put in more you need to put the eyes on model, put a little bit more information. But the biggest point is clarity. I'm going to do my rocker chick shorthand. So let me see. And yeah, I would say uh, follow along with me in terms of, hey, taking your design and then just doing a shorthand version of it. So shorthand is basically simplifying the design. 
um, and breaking it down so that you're not focusing on the 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 clothing or the um, the things that might complicate the design that will get added in animation, but what you're focusing on. So I have a circle and then I have kind of build off that and then um, her body is kind of this shape. And this is kind of a little thing. Oh, this shape I'm going to change to kind of this shape. And then from here, it's this, this, this simplifying kind of legs and then i'm going to give her kind of some like camo boots or whatever those are called army boots um so yeah if you look at kind of my initial drawing um maybe you know that that's also a sketch I'm going to simplify these hands a bit. This jaw is pretty, pretty wild. Okay. Here, let's see. Make her kind of more squat. And yeah, I think that, you know, this is enough um, breaking down into pretty simple shapes. Um, and yeah, I think it's like kind of a simple enough design that, hey, maybe these boots might be more complicated uh, when they get into animation. Like, you know, you might add some of that, blah, blah, blah. But they don't, it's not needed for right now because we're just storyboarding the thing. Um, so, you know, I think that this is maybe enough information to be provided for what we need. So shorthand is your friend. Take a look over here. It's taking a complex design, breaking it down into what it's essence, the folds of the boots going into these pants. Or can we just draw up, you know, the entire shape as one? And sometimes it's even great to simplify this down even further into almost like a stick figure mode. I'm going to be boarding this right now. And my thumbnails, my drawings are going to be really dirty because, <laughs> because we're doing this but shorthand is gonna help me at least. Just breaking these down into simple shapes. Shorthand, shorthand. Cool, and then the second one that we should probably do a simplified design of is some, some sort of rabbit. It doesn't have to be this design, it can be your rabbit, but I'm gonna break this down into even simpler shapes. So, rabbit, rank. fatty and then big paws I'm going to keep this Okay, so simplified design that was you know pretty quick to sketch out and I think will be good for my shorthand for my rabbit in a finished design there might be you know um, you know these paws that is that a rabbit paw <laughs> but yeah that that and there might be this detail that's not a rabbit but yeah, where But do we do we need that stuff right now? Probably not. Unless we get into something that's um 
Apparently I don't know how to draw a rabbit paw. We have our rabbit, we have our person, we have our shorthand. Shorthand is incredibly important to do this job or if you're just boarding out stuff for fun, for your projects, helping out friends or whatever it might be, this will save you so much time. Do not think that storyboards need to be these drawings that have every detail of your character. These are drawings that help translate the idea so that you can work out the story. And then when things go to animation, that's when things will be put on more on model. This is really, really a time savings tip. Do not take this lightly. I know it's super, super tempting to make a finished drawing or to make something look super beautiful by like having all of the details of that character. But I'm telling you in terms of the way that storyboard artists and directors and people just look at storyboards, they don't want to see these final designs. They don't want to see these perfect final storyboards. It's better to see kind of something that that conveys emotion but quickly and clearly rather than something that has all of the detail in the world but may even just kill the design because that drawing could be thrown out. Next up, one thing to think about in terms of this storyboard is what are we trying to say and what's the most effective way to say it? This guide from, I think that this is Mark Andrews, is a super helpful guide in terms of just asking yourself this question. At the most basic level, staging requires you to make a choice about where to put the camera or what angle the viewer will see your picture from. The first thing you need to know is what you are trying to say. This is your compass, what you're trying to say, to follow as you try to figure out the most effective way to present your idea. What am I trying to say and what's the best way to say it? That's pretty simple. What am I trying to say? What's the best way to say it? They give this example of, is the shot about the landscape or are we focusing on the canoe? Do we wanna build this atmosphere or do we wanna focus on these two characters? Is it about the long drop or how you feel about the long drop? Do you want this or do you want this? Is it about two characters meeting for the first time, passing acquaintances, or are they like really, really close? So just asking this question, what are you trying to say and what's the most effective way to say it? I think is a great question to ask yourself. What do you want this relationship to be? What are you trying to say based off of these two characters? This is basically like, hey, you can start your assignment as we're doing this, but most likely you're going to have to, you know, take it outside this class. Um, but yeah, I'm starting my assignment. What are you trying to say and what's the most effective way to say it? I do want to tell a story where this person is mad, but then finds the rabbit, finds the rabbit, and makes our life better, right? Better. Um, this person likes to be alone. I want to say that likes to be alone. How can we, sh how can we show that? Um, and this rabbit can't stand being alone. This rabbit can't stand being alone. That's what I, I want to show is that it can't handle not having somebody petting it. So I do think I'm going to go probably a bit of the setup of this person's just trying to live their life. And this rabbit is just wanting to be a part of it. This is, I think, I think is a good start of the relationships that we want. And it's the first time that we're kind of asking the question, what are you trying to say? And what's the most effective way to say it? That's for your story as a whole. But then asking this question is directly tied to your drawing too. It's what are you trying to say? And what's the most effective way to say it? What do we want this shot to tell us? I think a really good way to think about that is, yeah, a really great way where storyboarding, it feels like alive is when you get to ask those questions. It's not always the case, right? But in terms of what you hope storyboarding to be, it's you're always asking the question, what do I want to be feeling right now? What do I want the viewer to be feeling? And what am I trying, what am I trying to say? 
So plan out your scene. I'm gonna plan out my scene. Here's an example of a sequence plan. This is from Big City Greens. And you might see this a good amount. A savior is to plan out your scene. And these scene guides really do help. It's this top down view that breaks down kind of just your setting and where you're maybe going to put the camera. This works really, really well for an inside designated space of, you know, hey, we're gonna have this character move over here. And in that case, we're going to, we will have this set up so then we can adjust. It's just making it so that you know where everybody's at and where everything is in the scene. I'm gonna draw out a little floor plan of, I think this box. This is gonna be the box. The person's gonna be walking past. And there's not much needed in this scene plan, but hey, if you have, you know, this is this is her home, and maybe they already have that. This is a top-down view, so this is the box. This is the person. I wouldn't mind. Maybe this is a um I'm gonna put a fence here. A fence, how's this rabbit gonna get around this fence? And this person's gonna be walking this way and I'm gonna want them to jump over this fence and land here. And somehow the rabbit's gonna have to go. So yeah, I think that that's kind of a setup. And then one of the great things about this is we might not need too much of this right now, but it's to then plan out where the camera is right now. So maybe at first, I'm just focused on this person, right? But maybe the, the rabbit comes into view for that person and maybe I'm shooting the camera from over here. So this would be looking kind of over the shoulder of this person and there's, there's a box. At some point for this shot, I might want to put the camera over here. So this is just like, like a good way to kind of visually plan out and break down what's in the scene, um, what do I need to kind of draw, and just giving yourself a bit of a, of a roadmap of how you're gonna go about this. Think about where the camera would be as if it were a sitcom. That's that's one of the great things for TV boarding is, is a room plan like this. And then refer to the floor plan for tracking characters plus screen direction. Thumbnailing, again, is a savior. I'm gonna go through these and we're gonna thank these. All think, shorthand, you are our savior. You make things simpler. Thank you, shorthand. All think, this question, what are you trying to say? And what's the most effective way to say it? Plan out your scene. Thank you, savior. The idea that you can pre-plan your scene out. Oh my gosh, what a savior. Ooh, wow. I didn't, I didn't know that you, you didn't have to just be faced with this thing and then a, I don't know what to do, but that you could just draw kind of a box. Here's where the door is. Here's where the door is. Here's like a coat rack, coat rack. Here's the side table and here's the couch. Oh my gosh, this makes it so much easier now. Now that I'm not like coming up with it on the fly, but that I know, hey, when they come in, there's this side table here that they can put down their phone here. And then they can be looking over here and maybe somebody's on the couch. It's a great way to plan things out. Thumbnail. So we've talked about this. You know what thumbnails are. This idea of breaking down, doing a first pass of really simple drawings that make sense to you. It's easy, quick sketches that you can easily throw away. And we're gonna watch a video about it. All right. Pixar in a Box. Pixar in a Box is a freaking great resource. It's on Khan Academy. A video that's kind of just now talking about storyboarding. Now that you've had some practice with framing, staging, and motion, it's time to put everything together and draw some storyboards. As we mentioned earlier, there is no one right way to approach storyboarding. To give you a feeling for how I approach it, let me demonstrate. In Ratatouille, there was a moment where the restaurant critic, Anton Ego, sits down to order food at Gusto's. At the start of the scene, Mustafa, the waiter, sees Ego enter the restaurant and approaches Ego nervously to take his order. 
As Ego tries to give his order, Mustafa doesn't understand what he wants. Ego stands up abruptly, stands up makes his order clear, and then sits back down. Here's my thought process for boarding that moment. So I want to start to think in terms of shots, you know, storytelling shots where... So this person is going through thumbnailing. I'll draw simple frames, and I'll try and figure out what's a good composition to set up what Ego's trying to do, right? Ego's trying to assert himself. Ego doubts the restaurant, so Ego's in a position of power. So I might start with something like, maybe I want to see Ego in an <clears throat> upshot, maybe. I don't know if that works, so I'm just gonna keep exploring. I wanna find something that feels interesting to me. You know, I know I want a shot like this. I need to have a setup where maybe Ego is gonna be by himself. Oh, these thumbnails, so nice, so simple. Uh, sets out a plan, gives you a game plan. This makes storyboarding so much easier so that you're not spending a hell of a lot of time on that first drawing, but that it's just the idea of a drawing. And then it's like, maybe that idea doesn't work. Um, and then maybe there'll be other tables around, other people, you know, having a good time, whatever it is. And, and this goes into the other resource rule. What do we want to show, or what's the simplest way to show it? it is. I just want to make sure that Or the most effective the way of showing of it. There'll be a lot of people's backs, whatever it is. Even if I pushed him back further and made him seem bigger than the table, which is Ooh. another thing I can do. It's kind of like what they did with Clint Eastwood. You know, they make the door frames smaller to make him seem bigger. I might want to do the same thing. So even if I had tables around, people are going to seem relatively small compared to the tables, <clears throat> or at least maybe more in, in scale. But that's only because I want to make sure Ego seems like he's the biggest. And maybe I'll kind of bring in some sort of uh. frame device so already um, already okay. rethinking it uh we thumbnail it's it's, so it's just nice. I said, maybe building off shot. of the so previous idea maybe i'll put a check by it for myself check now i need to figure out more of what else can happen i know that a waiter is going to come in mustafa is going to come in at some point so i maybe what's the dynamic between them maybe i want to have and I'm drawing really rough here just because I want to keep things simple. You know, it's really important when you draw characters to, you know, ego is kind of like, like a spike of some sort, right? Maybe a vulture. He's all black with, the, you know, basically a white kind of oval head like that. And Mustafa, who's the other character in the scene, is a little bit more, you know, doughy, a little bit more round and blocky. So when I go ahead and draw them later, I know that when I'm drawing my simple shapes that this is something that I want to, utilize so I can keep my drawing simple. Maybe I need an upshot, so I'm gonna try this. And what I do in an upshot is I'll, maybe I want to have Mustafa kind of cowering a little bit. His head's kind of in his shoulders. Maybe he's holding his hands. Even though it's an upshot, which we've talked about being a, a position of possible dominance, I can flip that, meaning that I can now use size as a way to show dominance. Maybe I want to go over Ego's back altogether and make him occupy most of the frame. And therefore, when I draw Mustafa, I might have him, even though it's an upshot, I'm gonna have him a little smaller in the frame, giving Ego all the power of the frame. All right, it's a very uncomfortable frame. I kinda like that. I don't know if I'll use it, but I'm gonna mark it because I kinda like that. So I have an over for him. So now I need what's called a complimentary shot. And that is when you have an over, you wanna have a shot that is the other side of the conversation. And by over, I mean over the shoulder. Now I need to complement that, right? I don't want to change it and go, okay, now Mustafa on the flip side is not going to be big and Ego is going to be small. I don't want to do that because that switches the power. It's confusing and I need to be clear. And I want to complement that shot in my over the shoulder. So instead what I might do is something like this. And this is just me thinking. So I'm, I, maybe what I'll do is I will give Ego more space even though he might be smaller, I'm gonna give him more space and give Mustafa less. I want to now find my climax, so to speak, for my scene. And essentially, when I'm referring to the climax, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for that moment that changes the scene, you know? There's a spike, right? If we, When we learned earlier, the story structure goes as this. We start, the character starts here, goes through obstacles to a point or a climax, and then there's the resolution, right? Every scene is similar to that. We want to find that change, so to speak. So the change I'm ha I have in this scene is that there is a miscommunication between Mustafa and Ego. Ego gets frustrated 
and has to get into his face or do something to get his attention that shifts the power dynamic, you know, that we know that he's in charge. And so for this instance, I think that what I want to do is not be tricky. You know, I don't want to be up shot, you know, comes in a camera up like this where he, maybe he'll stand up in the frame, you know, where the camera might move up with him and the frame would look something like this. So, so he looks very, you know, dramatic, you know, as a one, two to the shot, you know, he stands up in the frame, he looks dynamic. Something like that oftentimes feels good, but it doesn't quite connect. And I need it to be simple and clear. And so oftentimes, like we talked about, simple and clear is, is the right medicine. And for instance, I think that if I was just doing a side shot, if I have my two characters like this, something like this, maybe what I'll do is I'll kind of go ahead and have Mustafa stay neutral but I'll have Ego get in his face, right? So he's gonna move up and get in his face and maybe he even cowers a little bit because Mustafa's already afraid of him. Everyone's afraid of Ego. And a quick movement like this can really change a scene without being overly tricky. So I think I'm gonna stick with that. And on top of that, what I might do is actually punch in, which is to go in a little bit closer and now show maybe Mustafa with ego. So I would really want to continue that action, so I really want to make sure I emphasize. And again, <clears throat> this is just a punch in, which means I'm taking this setup that I have, and I'm just framing it a little bit closer. Now I have to redraw. Working through the scene, he's already gone through so much, uh, so much stuff, actually. The setup of the shot, this uh, establishment of kind of relationship, and then already kind of this feeling of power and then this point of, of building climax. And it's just like all done within these simple shapes, these simple drawings. And yeah, I, it's super, super effective. Simplify thumbnails down even more. Take a piece of paper. You know, I'm working with this, but I usually do my thumbnails on paper. And I do just kind of break it down into simple shapes. And I think I'm going to do that a bit here real quick. We have likes to be alone, can't stand being alone, finds the rabbit, makes her life better. So what do we want to say? And we're planning out our scene. So first off, this person is alone, right? And likes to be alone. So maybe, you know, it's... Uh, maybe we don't see the box yet, but yeah, we're just establishing that it's just like she's walking on her own. We start wide. And then, you know, here as she's walking along, we get introduced to the box. Um. And maybe here, it's like we're first getting introduced to the character. And what do we want to show? That it's like she's freaking miserable. <clears throat> we're walking this way. And maybe, yeah, maybe this box is closed. I like that idea, where it's just a box. And she's walking. And then it's like, um, I think that maybe there's this idea that she like purposefully steps on this box. <laughs> it's just gonna be messed up, but that it's just like, she sees a box in the in the middle. 
you know, and maybe we're over her shoulder and we're kind of doing this down shot. Um, her. I wonder if she steps on the box here. So she's just walking and then we hear a crunch. And maybe there's some shot like this where, oh, I think we could pan down here maybe. And then it's like we show that She just stepped on a box. And we hear a meep. So, she's just kind of like walking along, uh, you know, not really paying attention. And then, huh? Let me pan down. She takes her foot off the thing. And maybe we show this and it's just like this messed up box now. Um, that's like slightly. Uh, yeah, slightly crunched. And then maybe we cut in. We cut on in on this box. There's a sliver that's there's a sliver that's open. Oh no. You're a little rabbit head. You know, and I, I just want it to peek out like a tiny bit. Four. It's shaking. <laughs> it's still got the box on its head. Um So we're walking. We're walking. She's getting closer to the box. Uh we're just tro strolling to the side and then ksh. And down, there's the box. You show the box, you know, maybe she lifts up her foot here. <laughs> uh, terrified rabbit. Uh, that's a little bit of the thumbnail. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with that. Um, and yeah, I think I can go through this pretty quick. There's maybe stuff that I would want to try out. Um, you know, just like, hey, maybe better ways of introducing this, uh, better ways of how can we crunch on this? I think that this is maybe a good solve where it's like you just hear it and then we can re we can use this shot to just pan down to this. Um, and that's what thumbnails are really, really good for. And this is how I think every board should kind of start. Take a pass with just kind of like a thick brush or something like that and just start laying down. Um, base drawings of your characters. So thumbnails, a savior, probably the biggest savior of all of storyboarding is just simple thumbnailing. Before you go in and try to clean up a drawing, do not do that. If anything, it should be in stages. 
I usually do actually a really, really rough thumbnail pass. And then I do a rough drawing pass that kind of like grounds it. And yeah, that, that first pass is just for me. And it's just like ideas and nobody can make any sense of it except for me. And then the next pass is like, hey, a little bit clearer thing of the shots that I decide. And then those things I pitch to the people that I'm working with as the first thumbnail pass. And then the next pass that I go off of is my clean pass. So I do usually have three passes. Let's go into the next of our saviors. The rule of thirds. This is a savior that you, we all see, we all know. It's part of our, I think, biology. I don't know. You can break down a frame into thirds, right? One, two, three, one, two, three, right? And these points where they in intersect, those are focal points that naturally the viewer feels comfortable with. And those are, those are things that like is a great guide to help the clarity of your scene. Behold the shimmering glory of this grid for it is the truth and it will guide you on your journey. Uh, I don't know who did this guide, but this is on Fluby Newbie. The points of intersection are where we want to place the focal point of the scene. So this center point, this point, this point, this point are all focal points that our eye is naturally drawn to. In general, the focal point points to one of two places. In wide shots, it's the subject's face, the subject being who you want the audience to look at. In close-up shots, the focal point is maybe the eyes. Notice how in the above shot, the focal point of the scene keeps falling where the lines intersect. This is a quick way to compose frames that are cool and clear. Ask yourself, who or what do I want the audience to look at? What's your focal point? Place the focal point where, using the rule of thirds, the lines intersect. Here's a good example of where maybe the rule of thirds isn't fully uh, followed, but if I break this down into thirds, is that kind of thirds? Kind of. That my viewer does you know, the focal point that I have is probably around here, right? And I do, you know, have a focal point kind of here too. So I am I have this character and this character or this, yeah, this object. And these are the two focal points that like I want the viewer to kind of focus on. And naturally just breaking this down into thirds does help to determine like, hey, maybe where do I place this in the frame? Maybe... Uh, I don't think I need to. It doesn't need to be 100% on that focal point. But maybe if I do move this character over a bit, and maybe instead I move this character or this this box down a bit, um, maybe it's smaller, you know, and maybe that's just a way to offer some visual visual difference. But yeah, these focal points, super easy to do really good guide i would actually suggest that hey a fun thing to do is to break your thing into uh into thirds and then to use this guide you know whether or not you're in like photoshop or whatever or just uh drawing on your own to then put this over your boards to go through the assignment the assignment that you did last and to just put this over and see if things are kind of hitting these points because i think that they naturally will um, and if they're not, then maybe that's something to think about. It's fine. Again, these are not rules. These are just tools. Hey, you can break this thing. It doesn't have to be just here, but the, these are ideas. Rule of thirds. That's your friend. Use perspective grids. We talked a bit about this, but boy, perspective grids, so freaking helpful to just ground your shot. Perspective seems scary, but in reality, it's just a checkerboard. We have this down shot. Let's make a grid. Let's make a checkerboard. Oh, that grounds it. You can do this. You can do this. We're just playing Connect Four or, uh, you know, tic-tac-toe, but at an angle, right? And what this does is it creates a ground plane so that then we can, then we can put things on it, you know? Then we can put things in perspective. Um, and to give ourselves a bit more perspective in terms of Hey, you know, 
yeah, just being able to ground our shots and then also to add perspective to our shots. One of the things that I did talk about was, hey, this is how I do perspective. How I usually set up a ground plane in my scene is I use like a line tool and I pick kind of a focal point that maybe is based on like the rule of thirds. This is okay to actually kind of just stop here and to, to do that. But it, you know, you can kind of even bring in more helpful perspective by doing the top plane too. And in terms of that, like, oh, this can really start figuring out, you know, in some ways buildings. And But really, this stuff, just this simple ground plane built on just lines is something actually I, I would say that's kind of worth practicing. So yeah, a good exercise is to just take a line tool, you know, maybe in Procreate and just pick a point and just build out from there to make like a sun kind of thing, rays of sunshine that all emanate from that point. All emanate from that point. And it's like, man, you have dirty perspective. You have a, a simple perspective. And then one, one other thing is, hey, that's receding in the distance. So, you know, this line is tighter to the horizon line, but maybe we space it out a little bit more. And then maybe that line is actually spaced out over here. So it's receding into space. Yes. And then sky, oh my gosh, we're doing it, people. Perspective is easy. It's, it's all been a lie. And again, actually, Oliver Thomas, that guy, uh, he has some stuff on his Facebook that I think breaks that stuff down actually really, really well. Uh, cool. This is definitely stuff to play with. This is definitely stuff to practice and then just start putting people in it, you know? Uh, this is not correct, but yeah. And what is interesting too is where this intersects, this then intersects. So this is another concept that in perspective, where this person hits the horizon line, this person in perspective further back would also always be at this space. So, you know, if you keep going even further back, these two characters are the same size, but it's just in perspective. And then if you do this, you would have a character further, further back. It's kind of at this crotchy space that they cross the line. This character is equally in perspective. So weirdly, all these characters are the same height, technically, but they all cross the horizon line at the same point. And yeah, that's also a good kind of a perspective indicator. How do you know when to stop with the perspective lines? I have a tendency to place too many and to confuse myself. Yeah, that is a confusing thing. I think personally, I tend to go with, okay, one simple thing, one line, and then I go usually like one, two, three, and then one, and then two. I do think that it's really not, it's, it's trying to get these bigger, like this is a good example, is like this line sets a depth and makes it so that it's like, oh, okay, this is receding and back, but this line, you know, really, uh, really sells it. So I actually only think you need uh, kind of two lines to, to kind of help you establish a perspective because yeah if you move this line kind of up then the perspective is is changed so i would say that you need two lines that are going horizontally and then a couple lines that are going um yeah out from there yeah two or three lines so simplify that down too because it definitely is true it's like you don't want to get hung up on that either perspective Ooh, here's another, here's another, uh, here's another 
uh where, what are we calling these <laughs> saviors <laughs> here's another savior when in doubt lower the perspective this is super super true by lowering the perspective line a lot of the time it makes your compositions look kind of just a lot better and here i'll give you an example um here's this person let's see This person is here, and we're doing this. And they're in a room. And so that means there's like a couch here that then has to kind of go in perspective. Oh god. And then like this thing there's a bookshelf and it's like that looks okay that looks fine and this is this is a pretty neutral perspective right just a but by lowering the perspective line here it makes it so that i don't have to draw this top layer of the couch which isn't important right it might be important sometimes where it's like, hey, if we need to see what's on top of here. But I think in this case, oh, if I lower this horizon line, um, it can really help. Just draw some stuff in. And makes makes it so that, oh, this actually simplifies um, what we're looking at. And, and it really helps to like sell, um, I don't know, just visual interest too. Like I think that this is more visually interesting than this. Um, and I would have to draw, like the background designers would have to draw so much more like carpet and all the, sh all the shit in the carpet. <laughs> and it's just like a nightmare sometimes when you when you could have just lowered the perspective lines and saved everybody kind of a lot of work, saved yourself a lot of work, and it looks better. And it, it's easier, It's it makes it so that, oh man, I, I don't have to really worry about too much of this couch. Lower that horizon line, lower that horizon line. That's the rule. When in doubt, lower perspective, lower the horizon line. Create depth using foreground, midground, background. Oh my gosh, a savior, create depth. Here's an example. If you don't know what foreground, midground, and background is, it's like, all right, we have this person. And let's say, you know, we have this perspective, but oh my gosh, if we put some foreground information, <laughs> you know, of like, oh, there's some plants, and then we put some midground stuff. And then we put some some background. You can really start getting a sense of depth of there's just, you have foreground elements, you have background elements, you have background, so thus it has space. So this is a good example of just using boxes. Yeah, foreground boxes, and then midground box, and then you have these background elements and all that stuff just helps to establish space for our eye because we always just see stuff with right there's kind of foreground midground background elements add those things that really helps to sell depth too don't just start adding foreground elements to everything that might be a bit too much but when you need to sell a shot for depth using using foreground stuff is could be great a real question is do i need this many shots so the idea of shot consolidation super super important here's a good example in terms of the, the thumbnails that i just did she's walking and then you hear a crunch, she looks down, and we pan down, so we're using the same shot, but just a camera move, to show, oh, what did she step on? It was a crunchy box. The other way to do it is she looks down, 
you know, maybe it's from the perspective of the box or something. Um, where, you know, and then it's maybe we, we're going to go to, you know, this next shot. Hey, in this case, maybe let's just simplify it down and keep, keep it so that, yeah, we're saving ourselves having to draw another shot and also the viewer having to make a visual change to a new perspective and then to establish something else when we could just from the sound be like oh she stepped on something crack then we show what they cracked on just by moving the camera down and this saves us a shot that really actually helps to sell this idea by consolidating shots basically asking yourself do i need all of these shots is this really really important to have this shot it's kind of cool is that it shows perspective and then hey maybe a bit of Oh, a box, or, you know, maybe it says free here. And maybe that information is important, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's worth it to have another shot and then to build off of it to then show the rabbit. Meep. That is definitely a savior is by just asking yourself, do I really need all these shots or can I combine shots? Can I make it so that maybe I can say the same point, but in this same shot, maybe, you know, the character can just do it through a physical action, or maybe they can, instead of, uh, they need to reach a can, maybe they can just reach off screen or walk off screen and then come back into the shot. And that goes into the, the other thing of finding cheats. It's the pulling out something from, you know, your pocket. And then it's like, oh, it's the note. And those are maybe just some visual cheats where it's like, we don't need to show necessarily all of the action or, oh, this close up of what's in the pocket. She's reaching in her pocket. Maybe it can just be, we kind of show it reaching down and then pull it out. There are visual cheats that make storyboarding a bit easier. You know, another one of those cheats is, hey, a character walking into a frame. It's finding these things that consolidate shots and it makes it so that collectively we're not drawing for the sake of drawing, but we're still showing what's important and what's needed in the story in the simplest way possible, in the most direct way possible. So cheat, find some cheats. And I think that we will gradually kind of figure out what that means as you storyboard. Without dialogue, is the story clear? This is always a really, really good question to ask yourself is by flipping through can I sell that it's like, oh, okay, maybe this sense of aloneness in this shot and then sense of, okay, I know this person's mad and then crunch, oh, they're surprised by something. Oh no, it's a crunch box. She stepped on a box. And, you know, can this all be sold without any dialogue? And I would say, yes, it can. There's emotion there. So if you, if you do have a dialogue scene, definitely go flip through the boards and say, can this scene work without dialogue? And if it doesn't, if when you take out the dialogue, it's not as good, then maybe try to tell it through shots or tell it through facial expressions and the, the character acting. You know, at some point, maybe we'll talk about cleanup and just kind of my cleanup process. But yeah, of course, show, don't tell, show, don't tell. Assignment. We have these beautiful things to help us, these simple saviors, and we're going to practice those with this board. One, shorthand for your character. So break your characters down into shorthand. What are you trying to say and what's the most effective way to say it? That's a question you should constantly be asking yourself. Another one of these saviors is plan out your scene. Just to do kind of a shot plan out and say, ooh, this is what I kind of want to happen and not just a go through and I don't know where to go from here. Maybe it's actually planning kind of like through a dollhouse. Think of this as kind of a dollhouse. Another one of us saviors is the rule of thirds. It's like a natural thing that, I don't know, our humans are, are drawn to and uh, use it, use it. Next is using perspective grids, right? And just using simple perspective grids to ground the character. But then when in doubt, lower the perspective line. It does really help. 
It makes it so that this background, you have to draw a lot of stuff. We're gonna have to draw a lot of books here. But this background, we maybe don't have to draw as much couch and maybe we can cheat the books or something. And then another savior, create depth using foreground, midground, background. Boom, foreground, midground, background. That sells and is used a ton specifically in feature animation. That's super, super needed to make a cinematic shot. Asking yourself, do I need this many shots? Shot consolidation, cut down what you don't need. I'm telling you, that is like a nightmare. Let's say you were to make a short film. Student films constantly have shots where you think that this is needed, but you could have found a workaround. You could have found a cheat so that you didn't have to animate that and still got a stronger feeling. You know, this character who's walking from here to here in perspective, and now you have to animate all that, does this really sell a point? Do we really need all this time to be to be walking? Maybe they could have just started this walk like this and then come into frame like this. And, and kind of in this upshot, just like here. So we don't have to animate the, um, the legs. That's a cheat, that's a cheat. So that we're not, we don't have to animate all of this stuff. And then asking yourself without dialogue, is this story clear? And that can be in the performance of the acting, that can be in the shots. But with this assignment, you don't have any dialogue that you can use. So can you still tell the story through the performance and through these shots? You can do it. You can do it. So take your rocker chick, your, your purple rocker hair chick, give her a rabbit. It's either maybe she's already had this rabbit and tell a story about their relationship, or maybe they're new friends, maybe they're new enemies, whatever it is. Storyboard a scene about their relationship with no dialogue. 20 panels plus, so hey, this is depending on what you want to do. And here's the other thing, if you're thinking, oh, I would, I would like to do this for a portfolio piece, you can make character changes. I think it is really, really good to have this prompt of, oh, they're new friends and it's they're kind of meeting each other, or it's this, this relationship scene and this contained storyboard, but don't feel like you have to have to have it be like a rocker chick if you are gonna maybe think about using this for your portfolio or something. Give them something to care about and have fun with this. Thank you so much. I hope everybody has like a really great week. Be kind to yourself, be kind to your work too. I know that storyboards are scary, but just have fun with this. But yeah, I'll see ya. Okay, goodbye.